I first want to uh, say uh, thank you so much to Pastor Burzens and his family and uh, Stronghold Baptist Church for inviting us out here. And uh, the accommodations and hospitality has been uh, above and beyond. It's been great. Uh, it's, it's great to have a cottage out there on the lake. It's beautiful. And uh, I never expect to see beach in the middle of, of the Georgia woods, but you know, <laughs> hey, it, it's been great. And uh, a lot of faces I recognize, some faces I don't recognize. My name is Pastor Jonathan Shelley. Uh, this is my wife, Carrie, and our family. We came out here. We're in the Dallas Fort Worth area from Steadfast Baptist Church. And so uh, we look forward to meeting anybody that we haven't met already. Um, I want to start here at, in my sermon in Titus chapter 3. Look at verse number 8. The Bible reads This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These are good and profitable unto men. And I want to just draw my sermon from this passage. And the title of my sermon this evening is this, Zealous Routines Maintain Zeal. Zealous Routines Maintain Zeal. And we have an admonition here that's very uh, strong where it says we need to be careful to maintain good works. It even says that this is something that preachers are supposed to preach on a regular basis. They're supposed to affirm constantly and they're supposed to bring these things up constantly. And I'm not going to bring up any uh, topics that you wouldn't expect to hear constantly in church because, you know, good works are going to be very obvious. You know, your, your pastor is going to preach on a lot of things that you hear often, but it's for a purpose. That purpose is so that you maintain those zealous works. And, you know, I love coming to events like this. They're, they're so much fun. And I love the fact that we get to come to church on a regular basis, come every single night and hear all kinds of different sermons. And, and obviously, anybody that's here, you obviously have zeal. You know, I, I can't uh, say that you don't have any zeal. You already showed that you have a lot of zeal uh, to want to come out and, and hear the Word of God being preached. You know, it's something that a lot of people are not interested in today is hearing the Bible being preached. But... You've obviously shown a lot of great zeal, but, you know, it's easy to show zeal or it's easier to show zeal for just one week than for the rest of your life. It's, it's easy to get zealous just for a short period of time. It's harder to maintain that zeal over years, decades, over a lifetime. And, and if that's your goal, then you need to have a zealous routine so that you can maintain that zeal. And the reality is any area of your life, you need maintenance. You know, when it comes to your car, if you're not constantly putting oil in that car, it's not going to work right. And you can't just drive your car without putting oil in it. You got to constantly put oil in it. Uh, you know, when it comes to your house, you got to constantly clean it. I bet the women know what I'm saying right now. They, they'd love to yell amen. But, you know, you got to keep maintaining that house or it's going to have problems. You know, there's a lot of things in your life that you have to have a routine maintenance, a routine uh, zeal for in order to keep it in good working condition. OK, you know, and I don't like coming to my house and it being dirty or smelling bad or those type of things. No one would enjoy that. And so in order to live a life where you really enjoy your home, you're going to have to constantly perform maintenance. You're going to constantly have to clean it up. You're going to have to constantly put effort and energy into it. Even your physical body. Hey, you got to maintain that thing, you know. If you can smell, you've been stinking for at least three days. If you can smell yourself, that's what my dad always said. But the reality is, if you want to enjoy your body, you got to maintain that thing. You got to put some effort and some energy into your own body. You have to wash it. You have to take care of it in order to have a well-functioning body. And the less you take care of it, the worse it's going to be off. The less you're even going to enjoy your body. The less you maintain your house, the less you're going to enjoy your house. The less you take care of your car, the less you're going to enjoy your car. And it comes the same way these carnal truths come into your spiritual truth and the fact that if you're not maintaining your spiritual life, you're not going to enjoy your spiritual life as much. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. If you want to go to Hebrews chapter number 10. And when it comes to spiritual life, you know, there's a lot of things that are extremely important when it comes to your spiritual walk, but, you know, this, uh, to me, is probably one of the most important things that you can do just because it reminds you of all the other important spiritual things that you need, but that is going to church. And if I can say there's one thing I just think people need to have a really 
dedicated, zealous routine is going to church because when you're going to church, you're going to be reminded of all the other spiritual things that you need to be doing. And in the Bible commands that you go to church. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to evoke unto love and to good works. Now we read in Titus chapter 3 verse 8, they're supposed to maintain good works. The Bible's going to tell us one of those good works right here. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The Bible literally tells us that we need to constantly go to church. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we need to be going to church. We need to be zealous for church. We need to have a zealous routine for going to church. You say, what does that look like? Well, for an independent fundamental Baptist church, that's three to thrive. Amen. Yep. There's a lot of churches that don't even have three services to offer. But you know what? I'm not going to stop having... I, I'm not going to stop having three services. I might have more. You know, and look, this week we're having more. And, and what a great thing to have. You know, 2020 and, and 2021 haven't been the greatest years <laughs> as far as just enjoying this world or enjoying the things. And, and we can see kind of some birthing pains of the devil and his agenda. And we can see a lot of evil is, is taking over in this world today. And guess what? Every single second that ticks on that clock is just a second closer to the coming of Christ. Right. And when we keep getting closer and closer, you say, when's it going to happen? I don't know, but we're getting closer. Right. By the time Pastor Menace is preaching, we're getting really close, like two and a half hours closer or something. <laughs> he told me I had about two and a half hours or something. I don't know. <laughs> we need that zealous routine. Now, I want you to go, if you would, in your Bible to Proverbs 22, and I'll get there in a moment. But, you know, it's really hard to provoke people unto love and good works when you don't see them. It's easier to provoke people unto love and good works when you see them. And you say, well, where am I going to see you? In church. Amen. And you say, well, what are those other good works? Bible reading. Soul winning. You know, it's easier for me to provoke somebody that's at church already there with me to say, hey, why don't you come soul winning with us in the afternoon? Hey, why don't you go soul winning with us later this evening? Or why don't we go soul winning on Saturday? It's a lot easier to provoke somebody to serve God when they're there in the flesh and you're there and you're saying, let's go, you know, hop in the car. You know, it's a lot easier to provoke somebody to memorize the word of God when they're there. And you know what I do? is all my kids, uh, if they memorize the verse of the week, they get ice cream for our Bible study. So it encourages them to show up for the midweek service, encourages them to show up for the Bible study. And you know what? I don't care if I give, up a, give out 100 ice creams every single week. It's worth it to me because I want them to have the routine of memorizing a verse of the Bible every week. And those zealous routines, well, guess what? They'll maintain zeal. They'll help those kids love the Word of God, you know, you're going to be reminded to pray. You're going to be reminded to read your Bible. And, and here's a benefit that you don't realize, but church makes you normal. Church makes you normal. When you're not going to church, you're not normal. When I meet people that don't go to church, they're not normal. You know, they, they're believing in the flat earth theory. And I'm thinking like, you don't go to a good church. You go to my church, you start bringing that up, people are going to start making fun of you. They're going to tell you, you're dumb. They're going to say, I'm not riding in your car because you're going to drive me off the edge. <laughs> you have people, they don't go to church and they'll come at you, they'll tell you, did you know that Donald Trump is still the president? And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, there's this secret, you know, White House down in Mar-a-Lago. I think, you're crazy, man. <laughs> They're like, have you heard of QAnon? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not interested. Amen. You know, and, and, and people get so excited about Donald Trump because they're not going to church. Right. You know, if you go to church, you're going to hear about sins like, I don't know, pride. Right. I don't know, like covetousness. Right. I don't know, like adultery. Right. And then you're going to think, oh, wow, uh, this Trump guy doesn't sound so great after all. Yeah. Amen. You know, and it's weird how this world, they, they constantly try to give you two different options that really suck <laughs> to try and convince you that one of them's good. 
you know, with Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. It's like both of these options are so bad, nobody would ever pick them in their right mind. Let me tell you what, Donald Trump, here's my parable for you, okay? Donald Trump is like the Impossible Burger. Who knows what an Impossible Burger is? I hope nobody's even tried it. The Impossible Burger is somehow a meatless burger. Who comes up with these terrible inventions? You know? <laughs> I want the exact opposite. I want a burger that's only meat, not a burger that's zero meat. <laughs> okay. But someone comes up with this option. Here's the thing. You present that to a Baptist, he would always reject it. Amen. You present that to a real man, he's going to say like, no. You should have never even tried. But then they compare, they say, well, you can have the Impossible Burger or rat poison. And you're like, well, I guess I'm taking the Impossible Burger. <laughs> you know. It's like, hey, yeah, the Democrats are like rat poison. No one wants that. It'll kill you as soon as you eat it. But no one in their right mind wants an Impossible Burger. Sorry I'm offending you vegans, but, you know, I don't care. <laughs> he said I was supposed to preach something really hot, okay? I saw someone wearing a shirt, PETA. Hey, it was a good shirt. People eating tasty animals. <laughs> but the reality is, going to church is going to make you more normal. It's going to help you not eat the Impossible Burger spiritually, which is Donald Trump. If you think Donald Trump is going to save our society, if he's going to save America, you're wrong. Amen. You know, and people get all excited, especially in Georgia, because, I mean, talk about the epicenter of the election, right? Talk about all kinds of crazy things going on. And look, if you think that the election was completely legitimate, you need to also come to church <laughs> so you can be more normal. <laughs> But people that get so animated, they're so excited, they're like, wow, I can't wait for them to finally fix the elections, you know, and get voter ID in here or something. But guess what? I'm not excited about that. Because even if we could say our elections from now on are going to be 100% pure, perfect, every single person is going to get to vote, well, guess what? we're still going to be doomed. I don't know if you realize, but this world is not interested in the things of God. If we have 100% legitimate elections, they're still not going to vote Pastor Burson's as your governor. They're going to vote for Brian Kemp. He's not going to fix the world. He's not going to fix our society. Look, why would you get so zealous to make sure that they can correctly vote for someone who's wicked? And you know what? People get caught up in the wrong fights. They get so zealous for the wrong things because they're not going to church. Because they don't have a zealous routine spiritually and they get sucked into all this weird crap. The Bible says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. People don't accidentally start serving God when they're not going to church. People that do spiritual things are getting into church and they're serving the Lord. And the reality is, you know, when you start hanging out with the wrong crowd, you're going to start believing weird things. And when you let weird stuff come into your church, your church is going to get weird. You start letting Jehovah's Witness get into your church and pretty soon you're going to start saying, well, nobody burns in hell. Right. You're going to start saying weird stuff like there's the God part and there's the human part. Yeah. Why? Because the relationships that you have are going to affect you. And if you're not in church, you're going to have a lot of bad relationships dragging you down. You're going to have a lot of people affecting you, but not in a good thing. You know, it's good to have people iron sharp and iron. But it, it doesn't help to have flat earth sharpen QAnon. Because then pretty, pretty, sure, pretty much, you know, Donald Trump is, you know, still the president. And all the politicians in the White House are holograms. And, you know, it's like, look, these people exist. They come up to me and I'm just thinking, like, what have you been doing? YouTube. A little bit too much YouTube. A little too much Reddit or something, or 4chan. I don't know what is it anymore. But the reality is, you know what? If you want to have zealous works, if you want to have good works, 
You need to have a zealous routine. You need to have a good routine. And the things of this world are not going to provoke you into serving the Lord. Look what it says in Proverbs 22, verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Look what the Bible's teaching. It's teaching a principle that when you hang out with someone who's angry, he can make you angry. You can start learning his ways. And it's not limited to anger. It's every single emotion. It's every single attitude. It's every single idea. People often are just sheep and they just, you know, listen to the loudest voice that they're around. They start becoming the people that they surround themselves with and they turn into a different person. You know and I know when you start hanging out with the wrong friend, the wrong person, they could affect you very negatively. That's why it's important to find people that are better than you and hang out with them. That's why I'm glad Pastor Ben is here to preach later and clean everything up. <laughs> I want to find people that are, you know, serving the Lord better than I am, doing more than I am, and go rub shoulders with them so that I can be better. Amen. If I hang out with an angry person, I'll just become angry. You hang out with a complainer, you're just going to complain. You hang out with someone that doesn't like church, pretty soon you won't be going to church. You hang out, and it's funny to me, you hang out with someone that's a, you know, what, Atlanta Falcons fan, you'll become an Atlanta Falcons fan. You know, it's interesting to me, when it comes to all these sports, people just like the team that they're near. <laughs> I, you know, there's usually not very much loyalty. You just like wherever you're at. Why? Because it's hard to go against the grain. It's hard to, you know, just stick to your own convictions. Wherever you're at, you know, it's just end up who you like. And the things that you do and the behaviors that you take. I mean, your accent is dictated by around the people that you're around. You don't even try. It just happens automatically. And you pick up so much more than you realize from the people you surround yourself with. And I'm telling you, if you get into church, it's going to affect you in a way that's positive. Amen. It's going to give you some good zeal. And you know what? You want to maintain that zeal. You have to have a zealous routine. Get into church. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. And we all know that children act one way in front of their parents and another way with their friends. You speak one way in front of your parents, you speak another way when you're with your friends. Why? Because your environment is going to affect you. The people that you're around is going to affect you. You know, you start coming to church, you might start saying some things differently. You might start acting a little differently. You might dress a little differently. Why? Because the environment you're putting yourself in is going to dictate your behavior. I remember growing up in school, I was not a very good student, okay, as far as uh, behavior. I did good for grades, but I was not good in the behavior department. But there was a couple times where I'd be put in a classroom where I didn't have any friends, I didn't know anybody, I didn't like them, and I would just be silent. I, would just, I wouldn't talk to anybody because there was no one to feed off of. There was no one to, you know, get me riled up. And, and I remember my teachers would be so confused because they would talk and they would say, oh, this Jonathan Shelley, he's such a hassle. He's always, you know, making fun of things and, and getting everybody riled up in, in class. And they talked to another teacher, like, he never talks. I never even got a peep out of them. And it was, it was confounding to them. But here's the reality. Depending on the environment you're in, you change. Your attitude and behaviors, they change. Hey, the version of you in the bar is different than the version of you in church. The version of you around the world is different than the version of you around God's people. And so if you want to have zeal for the things of God, you need to be around other people that have the zeal for the things of God. Amen. That's good. That's good. You know, three to thrive, two to survive. One is life support. It's life support. And, and here's the thing with pastors is they have to constantly look at their flock and they can see people start to fade away. And just as much as if you stopped showering for a couple weeks, and we could, we could all tell, you can tell when people start to fade spiritually, and they start to stink spiritually, and you can tell the direction that they're headed, and it's frustrating to you. And look, people that are going to church three times a week, 
they don't just like randomly leave, typically. Typically, people start to fade. Typically, they go from three times, now that's just Sundays, just a couple times, now that's just Sunday morning, then pretty much just every once in a while, and then just gone. But the people that are putting themselves in the routine, it's a lot harder for them to go. It's a lot harder for them to walk away. And the reality is, you know, if I miss one service, but I'm going three times a week, that's still two for that week. If I go once every month and I miss once, that's a whole month of services that I could be potentially missing. And it's a lot easier to break a routine by just one thing. You know, it's just easy to miss one time, right? Kid gets sick, your wife's pregnant, that happens often, right? You, I mean, you got whatever, you got things, you know, you got to give birth, right? Go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Did I have you turn there? Ecclesiastes chapter 9. The reality is, you know, we're all going to miss one service every once in a while. But when you're going three times a week, you just get right back in. Whenever you're kind of hanging loose and you're already kind of fading a little bit and you start missing, it's a lot harder to get plugged back in. It's a lot harder to keep showing up. And the reality is, I, I kind of thought with all the crazy stuff that's happening and how it's almost just obvious the devil's playbook. I mean, it's just like he's just telling us his strategy right before our eyes. And we see this world waxing worse and worse so readily. I thought so many more people would get more spiritual. It would kind of wake them up. They'd kind of be like, oh, wow, we need to take things more seriously. But I've noticed it seems like more people are fading. And, and here's my theory about that. This is why I think a lot of people are fading. is because they're so busy with other stuff right now. And they've gotten so tired from getting into the wrong fights. They're so into the fights against racism and they're, and they're in the fight against the election and they're in the fight for their governor and for the president and they're in the fight for their job and they're in the fight, you know, do I wear the mask? Do I not wear the mask? Do I wear 20 of them? You know, I mean, it's just, there's just so many, there's so much fighting and, and there's so many fights you could be in. But the reality is, you know, that's just a distraction to get you out of the good fight. Yeah. We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith. And I don't want to get to the point where I'm so concerned with all these other issues that I'm putting church on the back burner. That is changing my zealous routine. And you say, well, church has been shrinking, not growing. Or, you know, we've gone through a, a dry spell. Or maybe it's growing. It doesn't matter. Churches go up and down. But the reality is the majority is never going to want to hear the truth. But who cares about the majority? You can only affect yourself. I like this verse. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Look at verse 17. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. The reality is, if you really want to hear something wise, often it's heard off in a quarter somewhere, off in the woods somewhere, off in a small Baptist church somewhere is where you're going to have the words of the wise. Yet the guy that's screaming for everybody here on Facebook and Twitter it's stupidity. Yeah. It's not worth listening to anyways. Yeah. Why do you want to go hear what they have to say? Look, you should find a church where you're going to have the words of the wise men being taught to you, even if it's just you and your family. Yeah. Even if it's just Wednesday night. Oh man, it's us and three other families. Well, you're there. The pastor's there. Yeah. It's interesting. The pastor doesn't get to just take a break because not everybody's showing up or whatever. It's interesting that the pastor prepared a Bible study for you. And you know what? He prepared it for every single person. And you say, well, where am I going to get all the good information I need? You know, it may not be with lots of people. It may be a small crowd. But look, the words of wise men are heard in quiet. More. You want to hear the words of wise? You need to seek them out. You need to find them. It's difficult to find them sometimes. And the more you're in church, the more spiritual you're going to be. The more you're in the world, the more carnal you're going to be. You need to get a habit of going three times a week. It's harder to get out of church at that point. Go to Proverbs 24. Just flip back and go to Proverbs 24. I want to show you a verse here. People are just getting sucked into the wrong fights. And it's not going to be any different. As the world waxes worse and worse, there's going to be even more distractions, more difficulty, more pestilences more evil. 
You know, I, I wish I could say COVID's going to go away, but the Bible promises there's all kinds of pestilences in the future. And, and I've noticed this thing, the government, when they take a whole bunch of power, they never seem to be like, oh, I just want to give that right back. <laughs> when, when have they done that? I don't remember. It seems like they pass even more legislation and they pass even more rules. And they say, we didn't take as much power as we wanted. We wanted even more power. We're looking to take even more. And look, at this point, you could tell people, if you wear a mask, you're going to go to hell, and they'll still wear it. So, you know, even from an individualistic perspective, you know, that stuff's not going away. It's going to be a constant fight. And the devil wants you to be distracted with all of the, the COVID issues and all these other things. And look, I hate it just as much as the next guy. Don't hear me wrong. But I don't want to waste and spend all my energy on that. I don't want to fight all the woke issues. I don't want to fight for the Dr. Seuss book to come back on the shelf. <laughs> I didn't read them before. <laughs> They're like, another Dr. Seuss book is banned. And I'm thinking like, which one? I didn't read that either. <laughs> Who cares? Right. Who cares whatever they ban and whatever they do? I mean, these are just the wrong fights. And look, I, I'll talk about it. I'll make fun of it. And... And you know what? It's fine for a pastor to call out the stupidity of this world every once in a while. But the reality is, if it's interrupting your zealous routine, you need to change something. You need to get back in the zealous routine. When you start to stink spiritually, you need to take a bath. And you say, where to take? In the house of God. That's where you get cleaned up. Like what it says in Proverbs 24, verse 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. You know, it's easy to serve God when it's easy. It's easy to serve God when everybody's going and it's fun and they got Starbucks in the lobby and just, you know, everything's just roses or whatever. But you know what? That doesn't make you strong. You know, it doesn't make you strong to share an opinion online that everybody likes and it's going viral and everybody's so excited. Oh, you're so strong. You know, strength is, is standing up in the day of adversity. Amen. Strength is when you get up and you preach a sermon where you feel like people aren't going to like it. Right. Where people might leave after you preach something. You know, strength is saying, you know what, I'm going to stand with my pastor no matter who likes it. Amen. Whether my job likes it, whether my parents like it, whether my family likes it, whether my friends like it. Hey, he's my friend. You know, it's interesting, Peter had a crisis at a point. Is he friends with Jesus or not? And look, he failed. If Peter can fail, we can fail. It was a little girl. I know not the man. Can you imagine saying you don't even know Jesus? It's a crazy thought, but here's the thing. That kind of pressure, most of us probably haven't even gone through. You know, Peter's obviously looking at the fact that he could probably be killed. His life is on the line. He could be ridiculed. Horrible pressure coming upon him. Most of us have not stood the face of persecution where your life is on the line. And a lot of people, they'll get up and they'll say, Oh, I'm with you, pastor. Oh, man, I'm going to stand against them. I can't wait. I love your sermon. That was so great. And then a little girl's like, do you go to Stronghold? Never heard of it. <laughs> That's a dumb name for a church. <laughs> stronghold? What is this? You know? They still got Baptists on the sign? I wouldn't go to a Baptist church. And he's like, what's that, what's that Stronghold shirt you got on? Oh, this? Nothing. Don't worry about that. You know. Where were you last week? Nothing. You laugh, but it's reality. Yeah. Go to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. Go to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. And, and let me tell you this. You need to make habits that you can maintain. And I notice some people, they have zeal. And, and you know what? Sometimes people are going three times a week or they're, they're really plugged in. But their lifestyle is not a maintainable lifestyle. Let me explain what I mean. They're driving two or three hours to church every single week. And the reality is, sometimes that's just not maintainable. That's just not real for a lot of people. It's, it's a very difficult struggle. And the reality is, I don't want to make serving God as hard as possible. I want to make serving God as easy as possible. When, when I moved to uh, Faith Lord Baptist Church to go there, you know, I didn't know 
is where I should live as far as uh, the neighborhood or uh, where my work is going to be necessarily or any of those factors. And frankly, I'd never even been there. I bought my house online. But you know what I liked about it? It was four minutes from the church. And I said, I want zero excuse carnally to not serve God. I just want to make sure that I'm taking out every single block, every single roadblock, every single stumbling block, every single thing I can out of the way so I can serve the Lord and I can be zealous. And you know, what? I've seen people, they're going to church three times a week. They're, they're going soul winning on a regular basis. They're serving the Lord. And then they move three hours away from church. And then they start going twice a week. And then they're just waiting for the next life event. And that life event is going to change for them spiritually. What's that life event? I don't know. Someone dies or they move or they get a new job or they get married or they have a kid or they have another kid or they have some kind of a health crisis or they have some kind of a life event that happens. And look, life events are going to happen to you. And when you don't have a zealous routine, it's easy to get knocked out. It's easy to stop serving God. And then that person changes. Or they get married to the wrong person and that person's not as zealous and you see them slowly changing as a person. The person that was real zealous is now not as zealous for the things of God, is not putting God first, and eventually they're gone. I've seen marriage ruin a lot of people's uh, spiritual walk. They marry the wrong person. That person's not interested. The person lies to them. And look, I'm not interested. You know, some people get married in like less than two weeks of knowing each other. I don't recommend that. <laughs> People that have made it work, praise the Lord. That's great. And you know what? Hey, some people in the Bible got married like that, you know? Rebecca just took a step of faith that Isaac was going to, you know, marry her. Uh, was going to be a great person to marry. And, you know, that picture is a picture of Christ, right? We haven't seen Christ, but we just accept him by faith, right? But at the end of the day, you know, this life is a long life and there's a lot of roadblocks and there's a lot of difficulty and there's a lot of struggle and the Bible emphasizes being equally yoked and I just tell you, you can't figure that out in two weeks because you can be really zealous for a week. You can be really zealous for two weeks. It's hard to be zealous for a lifetime. And you know what? You're going to you're gonna have children with this person. You're going to spend a lot of time with this person. You know, you need to be careful who you marry, what they do, and you need to have habits that you can maintain. You know, that's why I also make sure I don't have any work conflicts. Some people, they're showing up, and it's like they barely can show up because they have all these weird work conflicts. Or they get a job where if they get promoted, they're going to stop serving God. It's like they have this job, but they're like, I'm really hoping to get this next job. And as soon as I get the next job, I won't be able to come to church. And I'm thinking like, I hope you don't get that next job. <laughs> why would I want you to get that next job then? You know, and this world doesn't understand the things of God because they're not of God. They think that moving should be because you're going to make more money. They think that moving should be because uh, you're going to have a nicer house. They think moving should be because you're going to be closer to your in-laws. Why would you ever want to be closer to in-laws? <laughs> Ask a married person <laughs> that's been married for a while. Do you want to go move in with the in-laws? No. <laughs> look, it causes problems. And look, some people have great in-laws. That's, that's wonderful. See them every once in a while. And have a great time. But what I'm telling you, hey, you know what's a great way to have a happy, great way to move? Closer to church. Amen. And closer to a great church. Look what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's the reality. You go out in the world and you get dirty. You need to come into church and wash your brain from all that filth, from all that smut, you need to be constantly renewed so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. Amen. The world will tell you what's acceptable, but it's not. The world will tell you what's good, but it's not. 
You need to hear from the Word of God what is good. You need to hear from the Word of God what is acceptable. You need to constantly renew your mind by getting into church. And look, you don't get zeal on accident. You know where people get zeal? From hearing a verse come off the lips of a preacher and it strikes something in your heart. Amen. And I know in our churches we don't really do the old-fashioned altar call, but the altar call shouldn't be a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing in your heart. Amen. That's good. It's where you hear something in church and you say, you know what, I need to make that change. Amen. Hey, that word of God pricked something in my heart. And you know what, that's going to give you that zeal. You want to get zeal? Get into church. Amen. And you know what? If you're a pastor or a preacher, you want to give people zeal, preach the Word of God. Amen. Preach what the Bible actually says. Yeah. You know, one thing that pisses me off is when a young preacher gets an opportunity to preach behind my pulpit and they preach their opinion, not the Bible. Because yeah. opinions don't change people's lives. Opinions don't make people more zealous. You know what makes people really zealous is the Word of God. Amen. Hey, when you think of the changes you made in your life, I bet you there's a Bible verse you could think of that's tied to that change in your life. There's something that the Word of God did to you. And look, that's why men of God are supposed to get up and to preach the Word of God because the Word of God will change your life. But if you're not hearing the Word of God, your life is not going to be changed for the better. It's going to be changed for the worse. The message of the world wants to drag you down. Go to Psalms 119 for a moment. Go to Psalms 119. And, and I love this chapter of the Bible because it's emphasizing the Word of God. Right. Every single verse in some way is a reference to the Word of God. And it's the longest chapter in your Bible. And here's the thing. Church needs to constantly remind you of some things like staying away from sin. And, and you know where you hear that message? Only church. <laughs> It seems like church is the only, it's the pillar and ground of the truth. And, and I know as a pastor, sometimes when I'm, I'm thinking about a particular subject or I'm thinking about something that people do, I think, you know, if I don't say that, no one else will ever say that to that person. And I think this person will never hear this message if they don't come to church. And you prepare a message thinking, you know what, I'm really excited. I hope the word of God can make a positive change in this person's life. And they're not there. And you know what? They never seem to magically come to church and be like, I made that change anyways. <laughs> no. Even people that sit in the church and you preach that message, they sometimes don't make that change. But you know what? The changes are made in the hearts of men in the house of God. And we need to constantly hear the word of God being preached. Look what it says in Psalms 19, 101. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I, I love this person's attitude. Notice, they don't have Peter's attitude. Oh, I'll, I'll die with you, Christ, for sure, no matter what. This person's taking heed under their spiritual walk. They're saying that I might. They say, hey, I know it's difficult. Hey, I know it's a struggle. Hey, I know there's going to be roadblocks. Hey, I know there's going to be things attacking me. And I know in order for me to keep God's word, I have to do something. I have to refrain my feet. Meaning what? You're not going certain places. You're not hanging out with certain people. And you know what? The best way to stop sinning is being in church. <laughs> I notice people stop sinning a lot more when they're in church presently. It's a lot harder to get drunk in church. It's a lot harder to look at filthy, disgusting things when you're in church. It's a lot harder to hear really stupid ideas when you're in church. Look at verse number 9 also. You say, well, how am I going to get better? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Hey, you want to clean yourself up? Hey, you want to be zealous? You got to take heed unto the word of God and you got to constantly hear it by being in church. And look, you say, well, why is my pastor always getting up and saying, you need to come to church? Because the Bible tells us to constantly preach it. Because we look at people that are fading and we're saying, wow, you need to take a shower. You need to clean up a little bit. Mom and dad are saying, hey, boys, take a shower. And you say, Where, how is the young man going to clean up spiritually? By the Word of God. Amen. 
By getting into the house of God and hearing God's word being thundered forth, that's how you're going to get cleaned up. Amen. You're going to be a better person when you're constantly being cleaned up by the word of God. And not only that, go through to Ephesians chapter 5. My first topic that I wanted to, break, to approach was church. And I only have three. I have, I have two short ones that I want to kind of mention here for a moment. But look, zealous routines maintain zeal. You want to be zealous for church? You need to have a zealous routine. And look, you can hear the words that I'm saying, but if you don't make a zealous routine, eventually you'll probably fade. And it's really life support because, you know, you look at these people going once, just coming every once in a while, they eventually typically leave. And that's a sad reality. That's a sad thing to watch someone slowly deteriorate and to get out of church. And when you get out of church, it doesn't just affect your spiritual life. It even affects your carnal life. It affects every part of your life. Because you're not being fed the things that you need. You're not taking the spiritual showers that you need. You're not cleaning yourself up. And one area that I notice, you know, you're not going to get any good advice outside the church is in your marriage. In your marriage, you know, there's not good advice outside the church in marriage. There's a lot of really bad advice. People, you, you talk to your friends, oh man, he's so mean. He, so, he told me something and I didn't like it. Well, you should divorce him right away. That's, that's what they'll say. Oh, he's so mean. He wants me to dress nice and he wants me to cook and to clean. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go work at the hotel where I cook and clean. He wants me to teach the children. I'm going to go work at the elementary school and teach 150 and show him 150 brats. That'll be way better. You know, oh, we better divorce him. You know, oh, your husband made a mistake. Better, better drop him like a bad habit. That's what you, the advice you'll get out in the world. And you know what? You're not constantly reminded to love your wife and to love your husband and to do right outside of the church. And I notice that marriages start to really deteriorate when they're not hearing the word of God being preached. Amen. Who's been, uh, where are you getting constantly reminded to have a good marriage outside of church? Amen. Who's trying to constantly tell you to love your wife and to love your husband? Look, I hear a different message outside of these walls. You know, when I see the billboards in Dallas, Fort Worth, you know what the billboards are? Oops, call us at this divorce lawyer. Call so-and-so divorce lawyer. You go to the mall, call this so-and-so divorce lawyer. I saw one billboard. It says, double your closet size. Call this divorce lawyer. And I was like, joke's on you because I don't even have half. <laughs> it's like, add one-tenth to your closet size, you know. Have room for an extra pair of shoes. You know, that's what they... <laughs> the messages of this world are not encouraging you to love your spouse, my friend. And you look, hey, you want to ruin every area of your life? Stop going to church. Right. Yeah. Ephesians chapter number 5, the Bible says in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves into your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And it's, it's funny to me, that people that will come to a church like ours, they'll literally say, well, what if my husband says X? Or what if my husband asks me to do this? And I'm just thinking like, everything. Amen. Everything. Yeah. Obviously, there's a caveat. If, you're, if your husband's asking you to murder someone, okay. You know, obviously, if he's telling you to break God's commandments, we ought to obey God rather than men. But if it's not in violation of God's word, you say, yes, sir, and you do it. Right. Now, it's not hard to understand. It's hard to do. And it's really hard when none of your friends are doing it and that's who you hang out with. Yeah. It's really hard when you're out in the world and your mom doesn't. It's really hard when your aunt doesn't. It's really hard when your grandma doesn't. But you know what? You should serve God and you should not care what the world's doing. And when you're in the house of God, you're going to constantly be reminded of how to behave. Yeah. Like I said, when you're hanging out with the wrong crowd, your behavior starts to change, doesn't it? The way you might talk to your husband might be different around your family than your spiritual family, than in the house of God. And the reality is, we need people to be reminded to serve the Lord and to do it right. 
And just as inappropriate as it would be for me to literally get up here and start ripping pages out of my Bible or to say, I don't like that opinion of God. I know the Bible said this, but I'm going to do X. As blasphemous as that would be is for a wife to say that she's not going to obey her husband. That's the comparison that's made. Yeah. The church is supposed to be subject unto Christ the same way that a wife is supposed to be under her own husband. And the reality is they say, oh, you just hate women. You know, oh, women have to obey. Look, I don't care who you are. You have to obey someone in this room. Everyone in this room has to obey someone. You have to obey your boss. You have to obey your parents. You have to obey uh, whoever it is. You have to obey your pastor. You have to obey your soul winning leader. You have to obey the people that are given into your life. We all have people that are over us. And in the same way that I'm supposed to obey my boss at work is the same way that my wife should obey me. And everything that's not violating the word of God. And you say, oh, I don't like that. Well, you just don't like the Bible. And the reality is, you know, if your children are looking to your example and you're not going to obey your husband, let me give you on a little secret. They're not going to obey you. When you mouth off to your husband, your children are going to mouth off to you. If you're always complaining about your husband, your children are always going to be complaining about you. Why? Because when you don't have a zealous routine, you're going to lose zeal for the things of God. Hey, you want things to go well in your life? Start serving the Lord. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So again, if you don't want to stink, you've got to wash your body. But here's the thing. If you don't want your marriage to stink, you've got to love your wife. You've got to nourish your wife. You've got to cherish your wife. And just like it's three to thrive for a church, why don't you get a three to thrive for your marriage? Why don't you have at least three quality times with your wife every week? And you say, well, why, why would I do that? So you can have a good marriage. You say, hey, my marriage is not going well. Well, do you ever spend time with your wife? No. It's like, it's not a shock. It's not, it's not a, it's very obvious why that's happening. You know, you're going to get out of the things that you put into. And if you really want to have a good marriage, you have to put something into it. And look, no one's perfect here. I'm not perfect up here. But I'll tell you what, I notice when I'm not putting effort and energy into my marriage, my marriage is not as good as when I'm putting a lot of effort and energy into my marriage. And I've noticed that marriage causes a lot of people to stop serving the Lord. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. You know, you need to take uh, time to enjoy things with your wife, enjoy things with your husband, spending time with them, putting effort and energy into your relationship. And, and look, marriage is not automatic. That's infatuation. That was dating. And for you young couples, I heard there was a couple who's going to get married. Hey, it's easy now. You don't even have to try. You like, every, you like all the things they do wrong. <laughs> he burps cute, you know. Oh, man, he stinks and it smells great. You know, everything's just wonderful when you're dating. But pretty soon those burps start to smell. Pretty soon all those things that you thought were really cool and cute, they kind of wear off a little bit. And then you have to start putting effort and energy into your relationship. And really, a great marriage comes with great effort. People that have great marriages, I guarantee they put a lot of effort into their marriage. And, you know, some people say, I don't fight. Me and my spouse never fight. And I'm thinking, it's because you never talk. <laughs> you, guys, you guys must not hang out with each other. Look, if you're not fighting, you're probably not even trying. But the reality is, you want to have a good marriage, you've got to put some effort, you've got to put some energy into it. You know, the Bible says, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. You know, you need to rejoice with your spouse. You need to spend time with your spouse. You need to put 
effort and energy into your relationship. And when you're not, you know, it's not going to be a good marriage. You know, good marriages don't happen accidentally. You know, it takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of energy. And, and here's the reality. If you want to maintain zeal, zeal, you say, man, I really want to be hot for my spouse. I want it to be like it was at the beginning. I want to have, you know, that honeymoon phase again. You can. But you know what? You have to have a zealous routine. A zealous routine maintains zeal. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look what it says in verse number 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except to be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And let me tell you what, you want to enjoy the aspects of your marriage that are related to marriage. You know what? You need to have a zealous routine. A lot of people, they say, oh, I don't have that same fire. I don't have that same burning for my spouse. I don't have that same zeal for my spouse. Well, let me tell you what, they don't have a zealous routine. With a zealous routine, you can maintain that zeal. Just like people that barely go to church aren't that excited about church. And people that, you know, barely work out, they don't enjoy working out. Hey, I took a while off of working out and I worked out again. I was sore for like two weeks straight. <laughs> Whereas people that work out on a regular basis, you enjoy working out. You enjoy the benefits of those things. And here's the thing. When you're not working out in your marriage, you're not being zealous in your marriage, you don't have a good routine, you're not going to be enjoying that marriage. Amen. I have one last point I want to talk about quickly. Go to, you're, you're, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Zealous routines maintain zeal. And look, this could be applied to every area of your life. I'm just focusing on a few here that I've noticed that really cause people to stop serving God. And, and we already have a great group of people here that have zeal. But you know what I want? I don't want people to leave and say, well, I had zeal. I remember that, that great time when we were there. I want them to maintain that zeal. I want them to be maintaining good works and carry forward. And we see it at the next event, and the next event, and the next event, and the next event, and then we're in the, the final event, heaven. Amen. And you're saying, oh man, I, I was just constantly on fire for God. And you say, how did I do it? You had a zealous routine. A zealous routine. And let me say this, when you make a zealous routine, you may not have a lot of zeal in the moment. What I'm saying is that zealous routine could take someone that's not that zealous, and it'll give you that zeal. It'll produce zeal. It'll build zeal, but it'll also maintain that zeal. It'll carry forward. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verse number 4. The Bible reads, And ye fathers broke not your children in wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Here's another area that I see people sometimes not having a zealous routine is, is in the area of children. And what do I mean by that? Well, go if you went to Proverbs 23 for a moment. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. But it takes a lot of effort and energy uh, when it comes to children, in fact, this is what I say. I say that children is the hardest thing you'll ever do, but it's always worth it. Amen. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do, raising children, but it's always worth it. And you're going to get out what you put in to your children. And I I've seen a lot of people sometimes, I think they lose zeal when it comes to child raising because it's difficult. Because there's a lot of things and aspects and, and there's a lot of things you have to do in order to enjoy raising children. But the Bible does say, and I'll read for this for you, it says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. According to the Bible, if you want to be successful, you can't do just one thing. You kind of have to do it all, just like your car. You can't just make it on oil alone. You need gas. You can't make it on gas alone. You need oil. You, know, you need a lot of aspects to all kind of be running smoothly. You can't just neglect certain areas and expect success. And when it comes to child raising, you know, you can't just expect, well, the fact that we're having lots of children, I'm going to enjoy it. No, there's other things you have to do to continue having that zeal for children. Otherwise, you can lose a zeal for children. You know, having lots of children doesn't automatically make you really zealous for raising children. But here's something that will help and keep maintaining that zeal. It's called discipline. 
Look at Proverbs 23, look at verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The Bible teaches that you're supposed to discipline your children on a regular basis. And I'll tell you this, I see lots of different families, lots of different people with all kinds of different kids. And you can tell the families that discipline well and the families that don't. And let me tell you something about the families that do versus the families that don't. The families that do are enjoying their life, are enjoying their children. They enjoy going out to eat at a restaurant. They enjoy going to church. And I notice the families that are not disciplining well, they're not using the rod of correction well. You know what? They don't enjoy anything. They don't enjoy being at home. They don't enjoy being at the restaurant. They don't enjoy being at church. And you can tell this is virtually everybody else in the world. In fact, a lot of the people in the world have one kid. They have one child. And they see a family of five, six, seven, and they're like, how do you do it? They're freaking out. They're like, this one's a tyrant. And I'm thinking, it's, you don't discipline them. You know, every time we go, recently we had somebody look at them, are they all yours? And I'm thinking, just look at them, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're all mine. Okay. And, and, and frankly, I don't even think that our kids are like exceptional or I don't think that they're more well behaved than other people typically, you know, especially in a fundamental Baptist church. But it's such a stark contrast in the world that we're constantly complimented when we go out to a restaurant. I mean, we're, oftentimes we're not even thinking our kids are behaving well, but then just strangers just come up and they're just like, wow, you know, your kids are so well behaved. And I can't believe you take them out to a restaurant and it's you're like, it's great, you know. We don't want to be at home and, and it's fun to go out every once in a while. It's fun to enjoy these things. But I want to keep having children. And if you want to keep having children, you need to enjoy the children that you have. And if you want to enjoy the children that you have, you need to discipline them. And the people that are not disciplining, I see that it, it destroys the zeal they have in their heart. I see they're not as excited when they have the next one, when they're pregnant with the next one. They're not as excited when they start to grow and to multiply. And you know what? The Bible says be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You know, it's a commandment for God's people to multiply physically and spiritually. And, you know, I don't believe in birth control. The Bible doesn't believe in birth control. The guy that practiced it, Onan, was killed for practicing birth yeah, control. Yeah, yeah. And the reality is, it's called birth control, not conception control. Okay? Conception is when a child is produced. Birth control is called murder. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. It's the Bible memory verse that we've been working on. And the reality is, I'm not trying to have as much birth control as I can by killing my children. And I see that children, or, I'm sorry, children that are not well disciplined often provide birth control to others. Because they're like, well, I don't want to be like them and I don't want to see all these rowdy kids. And, you know, I don't want my church to be an advertisement for birth control when they look at all these rowdy children. The reality is, if you want to have zeal towards children, you want to really love and cherish your children, you know what? It comes with discipline. And if you don't discipline your children, you're tempting hell with their life. And I see a lot of people, they have children that are already raised and they don't enjoy that child because they didn't discipline that child. And you know what? They lose the zeal and the love they have for that child because they didn't love them when they were little and use the rod. The Bible says, He that spareth the rod hateth his son. Yes. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm almost finished this evening. But here's one other area that uh, I'll, I'll give you just a, a tip and, a, and a, this is my suggestion also. Is obviously having lots of children can be stressful. It's very difficult. But I, I feel like some people aren't doing themselves any favors. And when you're not disciplining, you're not doing yourself any favors. And the Bible already said when you do things partially, it doesn't work out as well. Well, here's another thing that I, I feel like some people are doing partially. And it's obviously circumstantial. But the reality is the Bible talks positively about breastfeeding. You know, it says the blessings of the breast. The Bible says even the sea monsters draw the breast and give suck under their young ones. And, and I see some people that are capable of breastfeeding. They have that blessing from the Lord and they choose not to do it. They choose to forego that. And it oftentimes will complicate your child raising. 
It can complicate in the fact that your child, so, some people uh, are basically bringing back Irish twins. And you say, what's Irish twins? It's where you have two children in less than a year. Okay? And look, if you have two children in less than a year, praise the Lord. You know, children are always a blessing. There's nothing negative with ever having a child. And you know what? I want to have as many children as I possibly can. Amen. But the reality is, when you forego something that the Bible is constantly mentioning and bringing up as a positive thing, you know, it sometimes can make things more difficult. And zealous routines maintain zeal. I've seen a lot of people forego breastfeeding and they have kids. I've seen people have four or five kids in a period of three years. And, and look, I'm just being really honest here. When they tell you that they're pregnant, they're not even excited. They're kind of, they're kind of down about it. They're kind, of, they're kind of frustrated. They're like, man, I'm pregnant again. What am I going to do? And I want people to be only excited when you have a child because that's the right reaction. You know, the right reaction to have a child is to be excited. It's a blessing from the Lord. It's a gift from God. And the reality is children are always great. And I don't want to discourage anybody from having as many kids as they possibly can. But you know what? Having kids, you know, the way God designed our bodies is going to be the best. It's always going to be the best. And, you know, if you do choose to breastfeed your child, one thing happens, you can't get pregnant within the first six months. On a 99.9%, .9%, I mean, with human error rate, obviously that's there, but you can't. And it's going to protect your body and it's going to protect you from having so many kids close together that you may lose some zeal for child raising because it can be very difficult to have lots of littles. If you're not disciplining, if you're having so many so close together, and I'll tell you this, my wife, this is just a personal anecdote, but my wife, when we were first having children, she did not want to breastfeed at all. She thought it was like gross or she thought that it was weird. And it's mostly from the baby boomer generation, which really forsook a lot of breastfeeding. They really decided they didn't want to do that. They were very negative towards it. And it's, and it's put this attitude into a lot of people. And, it, and it's kind of given them a, a bad taste in their mouth. But... You know, now my wife loves it. She really enjoys it. She says she's so excited to come back to it. In fact, there's been times where she's like, I'm, I miss the fact that I'm not nursing anyone. She really enjoys it. And look, breastfeeding can be difficult. It can be painful. Obviously, some people struggle with it. And, and you know, hey, you got to get your kid fed. I get that. But what I'm saying is if you want to maintain zeal in having lots of children, if you want to be enjoying it to the best of your ability, you should be doing the things that the Bible emphasizes, teaches, uh, promotes. And the Bible promotes breastfeeding. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Look at verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, here's the thing. The Bible is a spiritual book, and this is a spiritual verse, but God uses carnal truths to explain spiritual truths. And the carnal truth, just as a newborn babe desires that sincere milk of the word, is how a new Christian should desire the word of God and, and wants to be fed and, and wants these things to be nourished. And the reality is when you do these things, it's going to help you in your child raising. It's going to help you in your family. And, and I really encourage this because I don't want people to be disheartened towards raising children, having lots of children. I want them to have as many kids as they can. And, and at the end of the day, you can ride a mountain bike on first gear. But you know what? Sometimes you need to shift gears a little yeah. bit. It makes it a little bit easier. I don't want to do more effort than I have to. I don't want to do more work than I have to. And you know, following all of God's plan is always going to be the best. Amen. Yeah. And so I would encourage you you know, to start creating zealous routines in your life. Go, if you would, to Titus 2. This last place we're going to look at. Titus chapter number 2. Zealous routines maintain zeal. And a proper, maintain, proper main, maintenance creates a smoother ride. You know, if you don't put oil in the car, it starts, you know, to jerk, starts doing weird stuff. If you don't discipline your kids, it starts to get a jerky ride. You know? You don't uh, follow God's commands. You're not going to church. Your life's going to start getting kind of jerky. You're not spending time with your wife. It's going to be a, a rough marriage. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be frustrating. 
and I want you to have zeal in these areas. I want you to have zeal for your children. I want you to have zeal for your spouse. I want you to have zeal for the things of God. But it's not going to come automatically. It's not going to come magically. What you have to do is you have to create a zealous routine. Look at Titus chapter 2 and look at verse 13. The Bible reads, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We're looking to the coming of Christ. That's, that's what we're all looking forward, forward to and, and we're excited about. But I, I want my journey and I want your journey to the coming of Christ to be with zeal. But I'm telling you what, it's not going to happen by accident. You must create zealous routines in order to maintain that zeal you have this night. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for uh, the instructions and the commandments that you've given us. I thank you for so many families that want to come out and hear the Word of God preached. And I, I pray that you would just bless uh, this week, that you would help people to be inspired by the Word of God, to uh, create a zealous routine so they can maintain the zeal they have in their hearts. And uh